Okay, welcome to uh, the Module 6 live Q&A, uh, the final live Q&A for DLS 105. Uh, what we'll do is people are getting logged on. Um, Bart Best is going to take through uh, homework 6 from start to finish, and then when he's done, I'll go through some quiz questions that may or may not end up on the final exam, and we'll talk a little bit more about the final. Um, so that, I'll turn it over to Bart and he'll kick things off for us. All right, thanks, Damon. So what I have up here is on the left, I have the um, Module 6 homework data sheet that was provided to you. And on the right, I have a, a fresh copy of the RMC SQRA Calc Toolbox. Um, as you can see, it's already kind of populated with some numbers, but that's, that's the example that comes with the um, spreadsheet when you open it. Um, so we'll start like you should kind of do on every one of these sheets is to go ahead and enter your information at the top. You ultimately want to check her when you get these done at some point. Okay, so we'll call this DLS 105 homework 6. All right, so the first thing. I'm starting out on the Levy OT Risk Toolbox. Just a refresher from the module, there's a, there's a, the spreadsheet contains both the dam and levy um, worksheets in each one. So I'm gonna start on the levy one because we're using a levy example. Uh, so the first thing you'll see is under the consequence data, I've give, we've given you that there's 10 hours a day for day and 14 hours a day for night. So we'll convert those into exposure rates. We'll do 10 over 24 and 14 over 24. And then we'll enter those into the exposure rate category up here. So 0 0.42 and 0 0.58. All right, the next thing is the overtopping events. So the overtopping AEP events, we've given you the, the, uh, the events, the event type, the event name, and the overtopping depth in AEP. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with those. So the first is your incipient overtopping depths. So I'm just going to copy and paste out of these. I'm going to, when I paste into this sheet, I'm going to paste as values. I'll do that. The next one's a one foot overtopping depth. So I'm not going to make a change there, but I will make a change on the AEP. Again, pasting as values. 1.5. Feet, so I'll enter the AEP for that. And then we'll go, so I don't have any more overtopping loads under the overtopping event. So next I have the incremental flood loading limit and the maximum flood loading. So I'll enter the AEP for the AP and the overtopping depth for those. So the first one is two feet for the incremental and 4.46 for the maximum. And I'll give the corresponding AEPs of those. Now, what you'll see is as I fill out this table on the top with the overtopping depth and the AEPs, the non breach table down below starts populating with the information from above. So you don't really, you don't have to enter the data into those. Um, the next thing um, we're going to go through, it would be the, the breach life loss. So that's also given under this category here. The first thing to note is we talked about this in the, in the training module, but the, the initial incipient overtopping depth is populated with a formula that looks at the very first, uh, overtopping increment. Um, that's done because, um, our standard procedure for our consequence team is they don't all usually run an, um, an overtopping depth at, at the top of levy. Um, but in some cases, they, there will be a data available and they will we'll run that. So you'll want to use that. So in this case, I'm going to take the, the 90 and 121. There was a specific scenario that was developed and I'm going to put that into this, uh, into those green boxes. So I'll replace those formulas when I paste the data in there. Uh, then I'll enter the the one foot and the one and a half foot breach life loss numbers. 
then the same thing for the incremental and uh, maximum life loss numbers. Again, just a reminder, you're watching me copy and paste. So when I paste, I'm pasting the values. All right, so that completes the breach overtopping table. Um, now we'll drop down to the non-breach overtopping table. Um, in this case, we noticed there's a specific scenario that was developed for that too, but they were both zero. So there's nothing else that you really have to change on that. Um, I'll, order, I'll enter the corresponding non-breach life loss numbers for the one foot and a half a foot depth. And then I'll drop down to the incremental and maximum numbers down at the bottom. Oops. All right, so that fills out the whole breach and non-breach table. And then we'll, the next step is to move down. The incremental table calculate. And then there is a question of extra, whether you want to extrapolate. Um, the extrapolation overtopping depth is where breach and non-breach consequences are equal. Um, in this case, um, we we get to a uh, we get to a point where the breach and non-breach consequences are equal, shown by the incremental up here. So um, we don't have to extrapolate on that one. So we can we can select no on that. Um, now. When you get down to the table over on the right hand side, you'll see the um, you'll see the way to make an adjustment for our numbers. So we can look at what our our numbers up here for breach and non breach are and we can um, we can adjust our table to allow for that. All right, so we'll uh, first thing the easiest thing to do is to drop over for the AEPs. Hear that we're not going to get much out of our table here because the selections are just not large enough for us to kind of move things around too much. Um, but we'll do the best that we can. All right, so now we got the table, we've got all of our data displayed from the tables above into this table down here, into this graph down here. All right, the next next thing is to look at what our estimated system response probability for overtopping with breach is. So we've also given you that information on this data sheet. You scroll down here. Um, so we've got zero depth, half a foot, all the way up to our one and a half feet. So again, we can copy and paste and paste as values in this in this scenario too. And then we, the, uh, the AEPs are automatically generated from, uh, extrapolated from the data above. So I'm just entering my system response probabilities that were given in the data sheet here. And as you can see, as I enter data here, sorry, enter data here, it updated this graph down below. There are same as above there, you can make adjustments to the graph here, but in this case, my data is plotting on here, so I'm not going to make any graph adjustments. Question. Sure. Yeah, on that graph, why does it max out at 0.9 when the SRP is 1? Mine did the same. That's weird, yeah. It's a... I was wondering about plotting the result. down below. Okay. It won't it won't impact the results because the, the results are being moved down into the table down below. There must be a plotting error in that um the way it's plotting. Yeah, it's just plotting to one point nine 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 nine. So it's it's just the way the graph just is cutting it off. Okay, I have one other question. Uh, the extrapolation above, is there mm -hmm. a reason 
it does it hurt to not ex to leave that as extrapolation since your data doesn't in this case it's not going it's in this case it's not going to make any difference because your data does go all the way to where the values are the same um, but there are you know in cases where the data doesn't go it it kind of becomes the judgment call of the person using it to whether it's it makes sense to extrapolate the data um, okay. but you so could have left it, it wouldn't yeah. hurt, it wouldn't hurt anything Okay, What's so you could, have left it yes. you could have left it yes, and it would not have made a difference. I could have left it yes, and it wouldn't have made a difference in this case because it they ended up being equal anyways. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, step three, uh, honestly, all this is doing is taking all the data, it's putting it into bins, it's assigning probabilities based on the data we entered in the other tables, and it's generating all the numbers to calculate your um, your breach and non-breach um, overtopping depth information. Um, so you can go ahead. Uh, just following up on the uh, extrapolation before we move, we move forward, I just want to ask like, how do we decide in a, in a different scenario where it does make a difference? How do we make a kind of a call to allow or not? And how do we decide if it is reasonable or not reasonable? Could you elaborate on that please? So this graph will come in handy when you when you look at this when it starts graphing when it starts graphing your data, um, you know you can kind of make a you can use that to determine like you know how it's going to work out for you. Um, I think that's the best tool to use in this case. Um, you know, in most cases, I, I would say we're, if you have if you feel like you've got good data that's being entered, you're going to want to extrapolate to it. Most of the time, your your um, Incremental is going to be close enough for breach and non-breach that you're going to be okay um, to use extrapolation. But you may have really just you may look at this graph and see that you know if you if you include extrapolation that you're it just isn't really going to make a reasonable follow with what you're looking at um, because maybe you don't have enough points at the top. Maybe there's a place where it kind of um, you know it maybe that the slope of the graph changes somewhere. Uh, maybe you have additional information. Maybe you know that at some point that the, um, that there, it's more like a bathtub on the, on the land side of the levee where it just kind of fills up. So, you know, it's going to get to a point where it's going to make it, but you don't have that in your data set. Um, you know, all things to look at. I would say the majority of the time you're going to, you're going to use extrapolation, but you do need to graph it and look at the graph and use your kind of mathematical judgment as to whether that extrapolation makes sense or not. Okay. I wouldn't um, say there's necessarily a hard, fast rule on whether you should use it or not use it. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. So then this table just quite honestly uses everything that we've entered above and it, it creates a non-breach uh, graph for you, and then it creates a breach graph. So the first first thing it's it's doing is it's giving you a QRA estimate. So that's what this this dot is, is is kind of your point estimate here, and then it's taking and converting that dot into a box um, to get an order of magnitude estimate um, for our SQRA methodology. It does that for breach, or does that for non-breach, and it also does it for breach. Um, as you can see on the breach one, it actually plots the non-breach point estimate down there uh, just because we use that in, certain, in our reports for certain scenarios. But there are, you know, multiple different areas to, to put in here. You can look at like a kind of a traditional graph. Um, you can do controlling, which looks at the, the AALL of your, um, of your SQRA estimate and, uh, and puts that line on there for you. Um, you can do none of them all together. There's just, it just depends on what kind of information you're looking to display. Um, from a Corps of Engineers standpoint, I keep the, I keep the report one on there because that's the way ultimately end, in our, end, up, end up in our report. All right, so that completes this tab. Is there any questions on that one before we move on to the next one? All right, so next is the, um, the economic one, again, I'm going to put my prepare by and uh, information in here.
All right. So this one, as you'll see, you don't have to enter your depths. You don't have to enter your AEPs because it's already populated it from the previous um, from the previous uh, life, life safety table. Um, all you have to do is bre enter your breach and non-breach economic consequences. Um, so in this case, that data is here on the on the left. So um, I'll take my again. We have a specific scenario developed for the uh, incipient overtopping. So there'll be a data here that replaces that formula. So I'll copy and paste that data into the spreadsheet. Oh, kind of let me. All right. Oh. I have to do it individually. Once I get the first three, I'll move down below the double line there to the incipient or the incre uh, incremental flood loading, flood loading limit. Sorry. All right, so that table is populated, and I'll move on to the non breach. Again, we did a specific scenario, but it developed a zero, so I don't need to change anything on that. All right, so that completes all the data into both of those breach and non-breach tables. Just like the other one, it calculates a, an incremental table and it has an, uh, an extrapolation point. Again, I'll move this one to no, and then I'll adjust my, um, values here. This scenario here, um, also putting yes and no, seems to have done no difference at all. I, I tried both. Correct. It's because it goes. It, um, it, in this case, it gets close enough to zero. It's not going to make a difference. Um, now, if we change it to if we change it to allow extrapolation, it's going to make just a very minimal difference because it gets close enough. Actually, I should have said to keep that as a yes instead of a no. Sorry, because it doesn't go all the way to zero. All right, the um, overtopping with breach moves in from the previous tab, just in the previous, as in the previous one, step three calculates everything, and then it generates the non-breach and breach economic consequences graph under these. All right, any questions on this one? All right, so move on to that. Next one is the, the levy total incremental life safety risk worksheet. This is where you're entering your um, probabilities of failure that the team would generate from your SQRI estimates. All right, so we've given you those here too. It's under the risk section on this tab that was given. It gives you the failure mode description, it get, and it gives you the APF, the average life loss, and then the economics we'll put on the next sheet over there. 
Now, the first one on this one is a yes, no drop down box at the top, which asks you is overtopping with breach a, a non credible failure mode. So if overtopping with breach is, if you choose no, that it's, you know, it is a credible failure mode. It then goes to the previous um, levy OT risk sheet and it pulls in all your information from there into the into this first one. So if I changed it to to yes in this case, it would it would take it everything to zero. In this case it's a it's an appropriate one so I'll does it and it pulls all the information in. Um, so the next thing you want to do is you want to enter your failure mode short kind of short descriptions over here. For the interest of time I'm not going to enter the whole short description. I'll just enter the the numbers that go with it. All right, so in this case, I'm going to go through and I'll pick use the drop down menu to choose the corresponding APF that's shown in the table here. And then I'll do the same thing on the life loss over here. All right, and if, once you do that, if you scroll down, it generates the chart for you where all the dots are the failure modes you entered in the table above. Uh, in the non-breach, it pulls from the non-breach um, information that you previously entered in the other tab. It calculates the total box here in red, um, and all that's kind of summed up in there. And this is this is a fairly simple sheet. You enter, fill out the one table, and you're you're done with this one. Any questions on this one? All right, so the last last one for, well, I guess not the last one, but next to the last one is the economic incremental overtopping risk sheet. You can see here it's already generating your APF data from the previous tab with the potential failure mode numbers. So it will, it pulls that in all, all the way and all we have to do is enter the economic average economic loss information from the, the table that was given to you. So it totals everything, it creates the range for you, and then it plots all the data just on, just as the previous. Any questions on this one? All right, so the last one is the, uh, the NFIP determination. All right, so in this one, there really isn't much that you're you're doing at all. Um, 
it's it's pulling in all the information from all the tabs you previously entered. So the first thing it's doing is calculating the total annual probability of failure. So it's pulling that from the levy total and commercial life risk worksheet. Um, then it's also pulling in your APF of overtopping, and then it's coming up with a a, a way here to basically take out the overtopping. Um, just so you have the prior to overtopping failure modes that you're considering. And then it's adding back in the probability of inundation due to overtopping, which is essentially just the, the, the top of levy loading. It's adding those together and that's what it's calculating is your API total. And then it's got its own formula in here where it's making the determination whether it can um, recommend accreditation in a positive, a negative, or an inconclusive. Um, so the uh, the inconclusive is we don't do an inconclusive recommendation. Uh, the inconclusive just tells the team they have more work to do uh, to kind of make this determination. I think I saw chat questions. Let me pull the chat up here. You got one more about NFIP. So yes, we don't make a. Um, I'll, I'll guess I'm make sure I'm started top here. Hold on. So for NFIP, um, we don't make a decision based on consequences. It's it's quite literally just the um, the probability of inundation. Um, it's not. It's not, it's not, it doesn't factor consequences in at all. Um, you know, FEMA has guidance as, as to how they handle uh, some interior drainage considerations and how they ask the, the levy sponsor to map interior drainage. But the, over, the, the kind of the, the simple answer for NFIP is really just meet, determining whether it meets the, the FEMA qualification for inundation of that area. So there's no there's no life loss consequences or there's no economic consequences factored into that decision at all. All right, Damon, that's all I have. Unless you need have something else you want me to talk through. No, very good. Thank you for going through that for me. Um, one question that I did get via email that I think would be helpful. Um, someone noted that you know in module four we covered RMC QRA calcs and how that would applied to our quantitative risk assessments or QRAs. And then in module six, we just went over the uh, SQRA calc spreadsheet, which would be done for our semi-quantitative risk assessments. Uh, the question was, what do we use RMC total risk for? And RMC total risk, once it becomes official, could then be also used for um, our quantitative assessments like RMC QRA calcs. It's just faster and way more flexible. So that would be the answer to that question. All right, so now that we've gone through homework six, um, I'm gonna go through a short three question quiz related to module six. Some of these questions um, or similar questions may um, show up on the final exam. So it'd be good to pay attention to these. Um, one thing that is a little bit different, share my screen here, um, is that in the chat, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and respond, A, B, C, or D, to see how we're doing and make sure that we um, learn what we needed to learn from module six. So our first question here is given an APF of 6.3 times 10 to the minus four, what is the most appropriate order of magnitude range that would be plotted on the SQRA matrix? We've got A, uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 5 to 3 times 10 to the minus 4. B, 1 times 10 to the minus 4 to 1 times 10 to the minus 3. D, 3 times 10 to the minus 4 to 3 times 10 to the minus 3. Or D, 1 times 10 to the minus 1 times 10 to the minus 2. Go ahead and... If you've thought about that some, punch in the 
if you think the correct answer is into the chat and we'll go from there. All right, looks like we have a, a lot of people that said B and a lot of people that said C, which makes sense since um, 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4 is found in both of those ranges. But the correct answer is going to be C. The best way to do that, there is a precise order of magnitude calculator that's part of the uh, RMCS very calc spreadsheet. You punch that in and um, it will assign that range for you. You know, that one technically falls within both ranges, but because what we're pl ultimately plotting is the geometric mean of our estimate and uh, things are plotted on a log scale, the best answer for this one is going to be 3 times 10 to the minus 4 to 3 times 10 to the minus 3. So I can promise you that there will be a question very similar to that on the final exam when you get it. Uh, open up RMC SQRA calcs and go to the precise order of magnitude calculator, punch in your number, and you should be able to get that answer correct. Okay. So, next question, question two. When evaluating overtopping during a levy SQRA, which breach life loss estimate should be used for incipient overtop? A, breach life loss at top of levy. B, breach life loss from the first overtopping depth evaluated. C, breach life loss should be assumed to be zero. Or D, none of the above. We'll do the same thing with the chat. So if you have your, um, have your answer, go ahead and punch that in. We'll see what everybody gets. All right, so the correct answer for this one is actually going to be B. A lot of you all were um, picked A, and I think there was one C. The correct answer is going to be B. If you um, remember back, and I'll show, show it on the screen here in a second, what Bart was saying earlier, when, um, when we do our estimates for the core, priest life loss at top of levy is going to have different um, life loss assumptions in it than when we start looking at overtopping depth. And the assumptions I'm talking about is about warning issuance, evacuation, and that. So the brief life loss that's estimated at top of levy is going to be related to prior to the overtopping condition. How the public receives the warning and how the public responds is going to be different. Over um, there's going to be a forecast of overtopping, so there would be more time. The so life loss is going to be less. If you remember here, the spreadsheet sets the incipient overtopping life loss equal to the life loss for the very first overtopping depth that was evaluated. Um, that might slightly overestimate uh, life loss, but it will overestimate less than if we had used the estimate at uh, top of levy for a prior to overtopping breach. So that's how that's done. Okay. So just to reiterate, you know, the brief life loss estimate used for incipient overtopping is going to be for the first overtopping depth evaluated. All right. And then the final question. Uh, given the following data from a levy SQRA, what is the appropriate NFIP recommendation? We're given the total APS of 1 times 10 to the minus 4. We're given the probability of failure due to overtopping as 1 times 10 to the minus 5. And we have the annual probability of inundation due to overtopping without breach. That's 1 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, the answer is C. We would recommend accreditation here. So to step through the calculation, step through the calculation quick. There we go. Um, we need to calculate the annual probability of failure prior to overtopping. So to do that, we'll take our total APF and subtract from it the annual probability of failure due to overtopping. That's 1 times 10 to the minus 4 minus 1 times 10 to the minus 5. And then to get the total annual probability of inundation, 
take that value, 9 times 10 to the minus 5, and add to it the annual probability of inundation due to overtopping without breach. That's 1 times 10 to the minus 5. So our um, total API is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 4, and with a value that low, uh, we will recommend accreditation. So any questions on those um, three quiz questions? Will that make sense to you? All right, if nobody has any questions, let's talk about the final exam. So there will be no quiz for module six. Uh, those questions embedded within the final exam. Uh, we'll get to the final exam the same way we've gotten to all our other quizzes via Socrative. We'll go to the Socrative website, uh, click student log in. And then for this one, the room name is going to be DLS 105R6. DLS 105R6. So you punch that in, uh, the exam will be 20 questions. Uh, we're asking that you get 75% uh, or better on the exam to get a passing grade for the course. Um, it doesn't say this anywhere in the participant workbook, but you're free to take the quiz or the, the exam as many times as you need. Um, uh, looks like on chat, that's how many questions? It's, it's 25 questions. Um, and if you, for whatever reason, you don't pass the first time, you're welcome to take it a, a second time or third time or however many times you need to pass. Um, the exam completion deadline is going to be June 12th. You've got a couple weeks to get that completed. Um, June 12th is also going to be the cutoff for any missing quizzes or homework assignments or things like that, and all of those need to be completed to get credit for the course. Uh, we sent out the uh, course tracker spreadsheet last week. I made some corrections based on your all's emails. Uh, we'll send out that tracking sheet one more time at the end of the week, uh, probably at the end, probably around that June 12th time to make sure that um, we've got all everything correct and updated. I'm starting to put in the homework six submittals now, so hopefully that'll be all correct. And then again, once everything's completed. And you've passed the final exam, then we'll we'll start sending out uh, course completion certificates and um, uh, PDH uh, PDH hour certificates as well. So one of the questions is: Does it have to be done in one shot, or does it save so we can start and then continue it at a later time? Um, I think it's one shot. I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. Delaney, do you happen to know that and how Soaker is works? Is that a one shot deal? Hi. Um, I am not sure, but I can find out real quick and give you the answer. Ethan, thank you. Well, I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um I want to I want to say that I think most people are able to get through things, you know, fairly quickly. There's a number of questions that are true-false and definition-type things that shouldn't take long. Uh, the, the calculations that I ask you to do are fairly straightforward and simple. So, it, yeah, get it done that it shouldn't be too bad. Um, it's also open note, so, you know, feel free to go through the um, – PowerPoint presentation, PDFs, and things like that if you're not sure on an answer and double check things. So we've had good success. I haven't had any participants uh, not pass the exam. So um, take your time, work yourself through it, and everything should come out pretty well, I would think. So the question is, what notes do you recommend having on hand, the PowerPoint slides and the homework? Yeah, the, having the PowerPoint slides available is probably going to be the most helpful to you. I don't think you need the um, homework files, but 
ready or available. Most of the things I'm going to be asking on the exam are simpler than what we did for the, the homework. Um, you all, it would also be a good idea to review the very first part of all the live Q&As. If you remember, that's where we went over the, um, the module quizzes. A lot of the questions are going to be similar. Some are going to be exactly the same. So having those um, and reviewing those ahead of time would also be helpful. It sounds like um, Socrative will not remember where you leave off, so it's recommended that you take it all in one sitting. Um, if you log out of the quiz, it will have you start over. Gotcha. Thank you for that. That's what I was what I was thinking too, but wasn't sure. So thank you for confirming that. We got one shot. Yeah, no problem. And I'm also okay with, um, you know, if you log in, I, I'm trying to remember if it's all one question per page or if they're all on one page and you can get a sense for the questions and kind of, you know, if there's something that you don't know the answer to, look around and then come back and restart it. That works for me too. Last reminder is that the exam and all makeup work, uh, we're shooting for June 12th at. I'll be checking the RMC email address for those to know. And we'll be there. So thanks, everybody.